Well, the local warlock and I are pulling the sun out of this. You see what the, the day has been, right? And you see the blue coming out. This cod wasn't even supposed to be here, right? We have a an unmitigated high all along the coast. Wonderful eagles. We've said, paid our respect to the the eagle, the eagle pole over here. I call it the eagle pole from now on. Uh, the circle I made yesterday is still there, and the circle I made a couple summers ago is still here. People have added a bit here and there. It's good. I like how it blends in really nicely. It's not stark and. Um, when I said hello out here, this eagle came down here and just... Animals have their own language. Okay. You see the silhouette. Before this day is out, you'll see a sun and probably that eagle flying over here. Huh? Just going to check my surroundings. I don't think there's any two-leggeds around here. We've got the chopper coming in, interrupting the fidelity in this current of creation. So how have they gained access, we have to wonder, huh? The access of noise, or Zion, as the holographic decoder talks about it. The noise of Zion. Really, I have to say again, because I've had a few days, the guy that did the holographic disclosure, you know, good job, man. I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have made a millisecond of that video series, so it's amazing, the talent uh, that it takes. Maybe he took some stuff out of his ass, maybe, you know, the idea that he has access to the top of the pyramid is true, maybe it's not. Maybe we should all give ourselves the credit of having access to whatever the fuck we need to know. And if that's all the guy had to do, then great, good on you. However way you get knowledge, I mean, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where he got it or didn't get it. What matters is what it speaks to you. Okay, let's not pay attention to the fucking chopper. We got a sun to bring out in this guy. Let's bring out the sun. Let's bring out the sun of Kundum come into the kingdom coming everywhere. That things will come even as they run over some nice lady's bum. Dripping down her thighs, her opalescent sighs. We wonder why we make this song. Maybe it's because we want to be in lust with a woman without a schlong. You might think that's a funny type of request. But then you're talking to a man who hasn't seen a woman's breast. Since the so-called Bush administration I haven't seen a woman who's still undergoing menstruation That says a lot about me But if the sun comes out That's okay, don't you think? I don't think it's possible that this stupid song has anything to do with a celestial slong But there you go, the sire of the sky, the sire of the eye, oh, the sire that would be mine. What do we need to come into this world? What would favor the unfolding brain of every boy and girl? I think they need to be in nature. They need to play with stones. They need to get their hands in rivers. They need to cut their bones. They need to breathe and feel and touch and think and see and do under their very own kind of power in its illimitable blue. They need to draw out of their mind the flesh and blood that they have already conceived of with their mother. Their, their own good love. Look at that congress of birds. We've got a sun coming out. We've got rivers. What's not to like here? We've got, we've, we've got marijuana. Do I sound like a de desperately depressed person? <laughs> oh, these, this is a treat. I just absolutely treat. There's just eagles all over the place. Because there's fish and because that means bear might be around here. But for some reason, I'm not paying any heed to my, 
usual qualms about entering bear territory. Isn't this lovely? And you get this reward, this current of energy. Why would we think something is beautiful if we don't feel something? Right? And I say to people, you always feel something when an eagle flies over you, don't you? You probably feel something when you see a bear. You don't feel nothing. You know, we don't have to wait for some Jesus to walk the earth. Just think of the beings that make you feel something. You know? Especially beings who aren't paid to make you feel something. That's really good. Right? Things and beings that aren't paid to make us feel something. Let's put them into one category. Okay? And let's put things and beings who are paid, who have some perhaps underhanded interest in making us feel all kinds of things. And into which we introduce. We are we have obviously been introduced. We we bear whatever ills, we, we learn, we have fun, we have whatever kind of life we have, and maybe nobody should tell us what kind of life that is but us. Which is precisely my point what that life is. It's so big, it's so complicated. Anyone could fashion and imagine any kind of evil over here where there is none, and good many places where there is none of that either. If, and if not to you, maybe to a lot of other people. And we have to imagine this, of course, across a landscape of history, media, and information that is woefully beset by out-and-out -out lying. First and foremost, it tops the charts of the anthem of every what we call every era and epoch of our existence going back through the dinosaurs. I feel very much less inclined to believe any of that shit. But in awe of the capacity to mobilize so much evidently sophisticated industry out of the muck of the education system. Right? If you don't admire that, if you don't think there's something, you know, something to that, like, wow, I mean... It's overwhelming. You think, well, if I can't think of a better thing for people to do, you know, what, what really say should I have in it, right? But I, that's just it. I don't want to tell other people what to do. And the only thing I object about the world is in any fashion that people are told what to do. You may think it's in your interest to be told what to do. Maybe you go into some place you've never been. Maybe it's uh, a bit socially complicated. There's an usher. Maybe he shows you where to sit. Maybe, most of us probably don't, you know, move in these circles, but it might be necessary in some instances for someone to tell us what to say. Have you ever been in a conversation with anyone and felt there are things you shouldn't say? Or couldn't say? Or shouldn't bother saying? Do you take a strategic interest in what you do or do not say to people of any kind of significance in your life? Because then you edit, don't you? You self-censure. It's not deplorable in itself. But then I wonder, is there other areas of life, like myself, where you maybe compensate with not being able to really have enter into a conversation because you can't enter into enough of a trust? And the people I meet in my life, they're just more or less different versions of the old man I met today. They're just looking for a reason to tell you what they know. Because that's how they understand their relationship to anyone. It's a little less offensive the older they get, but you see more of the same thing. It's like seeing transgenders. It's just like, you know, something that might have seemed completely uh, innocuous ten years ago now just doesn't feel right at all. You know, I've written around 50 very large volumes of books in under ten years. 50 books worth, let's say. I think I've got just over 40 actually published on my own, like, self-publishing website. Just some free thing, right? And I don't say that for any other reason. In fact, I never mention that except to make this point. I, it's not, I don't care if anyone looks at it, whatever. It's not the point. Uh, in my interpersonal life, I would love at some point the opportunity just to be able to share at the heart level what my writing means to me. You know, and that, that these volumes, if I could ever afford to buy any of them myself, um, you know, might be might be nice to hold in one's hand from time to time. I know they'll be hold, nice to hold in mine. I, I, I love my work. You know, I wouldn't have spent as much time writing if I didn't like my own writing. If I didn't feel the benefit. And it's, uh, it's something that's made me delirious. You know, and sometimes maybe it's been my worst enemy because it's made me, it's often been the only thing that made me think that life was worth living. That life was actually beautiful. I didn't just have to, you know, try to work, 
screw my mind up into a good mood, I could actually commune with the primal intelligence of the earth. And that I was well suited to that. And probably everybody was. But it's staggering how many people don't spend time doing things like that. But in all the people I've known, friends, old high school friends, girlfriends, family, nobody's ever taken the slightest interest or even knows that I've written a book, let alone 40 of them. Do you understand? It's illuminating, isn't it? How little interest people will take in a man capable of the kind of craft that I am. Because I don't sell it. Yet yeah, it's, it's not something that I've done it's the part of my life that my whole mind occupies. My life has been occupied with this. I'm obviously, you know, people got to know me on that level. They would find and ask questions about my world. And it's a little sad that people's worlds aren't that nice, that they even imagine that somebody's world is equally curious as their own. Because a person who lived like I did would just naturally be curious. Hey, how do you do that? Oh, what do you think of that? By the time you get to a certain age in life, chances are you've probably spent a lot of time doing or thinking something. This is the, the true occupation of man. It's just what you've done. It doesn't matter whether you've made money at it or not. It's just what you've obviously, hopefully, felt worth spending your time learning to do. And you might be asked to, to give some evidence that it's been of any advantage to you or that it should be of any advantage to anyone. People sometimes think that literature is a good thing for the world. I don't really think that it is, necessarily, and I don't think that my work is necessarily a good thing to the world. Any more that the crap in the toilet bowl is a good thing to the world. It's just something that's come through me, something that I enjoyed doing, something that was good for me. I know, down deep, that it's good for other people, too. I know, down deep, that... You know, a provision for inclination, personality, and circumstances, some people might be interested or find some of my work stimulating. That's all. And with those people, we would have a great relationship of any kind, whether it be author to reader or uh, you name it. It's just a good relationship. It's nice when people have taken the time to stimulate our mind and found their own primarily so stimulating in so confusing a world. And if you've ever thought of yourself as someone who's went through a particular kind of trial in life, chances are you would recognize a lot of the material in my books, which comes right out of the trials of my life, in my own words. And what I found is my interest in my own life wasn't really... Because it yields a kind of language... Your, your, your life. Maybe it says, maybe the language first and foremost is just how you are, you feel and think. Whether you like your life and what gives you some reason to, to like it. What set of circumstance gave rise to the person you are today? And as I said to my mom this morning, it may not be so much what you are, but where you are. To be wary of where we are. To be aware, which is where we are. And if you're aware, strangely enough, I don't think it means you have a fixed idea of your environment. It may be that our environment is constantly changing. It may mean something different every moment. We take a liberty, don't we? Stringing thoughts and feelings and life together and calling it ours, which itself is a supremely creative act, not dissimilar to that of our what, what, what precipitated our birth in the first place. It's, it is a fully sexual... Oh, smell that. It is a full sexual... This is, that's the salmon. I'm smelling sex. Holy shit. It's a fully sexual experience. Oh, wow. My nose is really getting... By the way, before I made this video, I actually whacked myself in the nose. I was hitting a stick with another stick, and it flipped around, whacked me, like punched me in the nose. It was like, wow. That stimulates the nose area, hey? Hopefully I'll smell a bear before they come. If I had the nose of a bear, I wouldn't have to worry too much. But I'm not as worried if I have been, so I don't know what that means. But I've obviously changed. So I've obviously changed. I'm here now at the sacred place. I've been basically decided I wasn't going to come for months. And it feels like now, mid-November, that it's okay. So I gave a period 
to, you know, just, I don't know why. People, people, some people do that. It might seem strange, but some people do that. Yeah. Maybe I take myself too seriously. We still haven't seen that sun yet. We'll keep going. It's my joint over there. I'm guessing some more people are going to show up. Pink. Pink. I don't really have a pink chakra. I never thought about if there's a pink chakra. Pink chakra, where are you? We've got every color but you. What makes pink? Red and blue? Red and orange? Red and purple? I don't know. Probably red and... Uh, some combination. I haven't really gotten to combinations of chakras yet. That would be fascinating, though. I'm gonna see some sun. Whether I'm having any part in that or not. We, I should say, sorry. Awareness, I think, is, is about where we are. It's our relationship to our environment. There's no getting away. If you're talking about flesh and blood and the mind, there's no getting away with your flesh and blood and your environment. The flesh of everything. You're surrounded by everything. You're immersed in life. Whether it's some demonic evil that's controlled the matrix of your own reality complex from the center of your brain and through thousands of years of all kinds of unfortunate lapses in our capacity or that of our elders to protect us as a void or something was there to protect the earth from basically, you know, demonic, angelic kinds of intelligences. They didn't fall so much as they burrowed their way through <laughs> from their cosmic septic tank. Here, it's a story, isn't it? Everything's a story. Maybe you'll never meet angels. Maybe you've never looked around you and thought, there's, there's some sort of hive-like intelligence that's trying to disturb the coherence of mind doing something like what a man or woman should do with their time when they have the time to spend time with themselves, their ancestors, nature, the stark, living, breathing fact of life. You get that invigorated. Not that it's not nice being home, but... You can see the sun on those trees over there. We're getting there. We need new light. We need a breakthrough. We get some fertility. I don't know what I'm talking about. Pink. Not a color I see outside very often. <laughs> not, not a color I see outside very often. Sir, did you just fling your excrement on top of my lumberjacks? No, sir. Eagles, salmon, eagles. That's good. Oh, there you go. There you go. Woohoo! Sing this, sister. We'll get some sun. I hear ya. Sun is coming. Sun is coming. Sun is coming. The epic of evil is over. Oh, the epic of evil is ending. Son of man. <laughs> what if the son of man came back?
What if the Son of Man returned? Victorious. <coughs> what would she say? What would he say? Who will crack the code? For whom will the cosmic tumblers roll? When everything is in question, when every belief is in doubt, when the entire throbbing mass of man, good and evil, all of the power of man, used and misused, is transfigured. seems the son of man, or the star Sirius, had some previous acquaintance with evil. <clears throat> Long before she conceived of her own fire, her own flesh and blood. her own earth and water, air and fire, and the ire in her air, the fire in her water, the water in the earth, and the earth in the air, in the sea, and in the sky. And the sounds and the smells and the worries and the fears. It seems time was that you could conjure up a fear out of anything. Conjure it up, make it as large or small as you want it to be. Use it to explain things, even, to yourself. You find a way to be true, brilliant, alive, joyful, peaceful, strong-willed, though nobody should notice, complete. <sighs> complete like the sun like the circle of the year. And only you know the hours that make up that circle and the days that make up that circle. For that circle made up your own flesh and blood and your life, the flesh and blood. Of all creation, Of all that people will look at and why and say, what does this mean to me? Does this make me stronger? Does this make me more peace or with more understanding? Is this taking me in a direction that I want to go? If this is completely my decision. If my desires like that of my own mother, the brightest star in the sky, the, the star on the top of every tree, and every tree on the trunk or in the trunk of the tree of life. And in every star, an eagle. And from every eagle's, eagle's wings, the dew of all the beauty that grows upon the earth. And in the earth, flesh and blood of our own mother. The circle is complete. The current is magnified. Something that speaks true through all the ages and all the states of mind.
and all the belief. Something within our own kin, within our own blood, that allows us to draw from everything exactly what we need, exactly what we need, hour after hour. And if we can't, we have to ask ourselves, why not? What is preventing us? What or who stands in our way? Is it our own anger? Loneliness? Fear? Was it ever any of those things? Was there some disproportionate relationship to authority? Or to what would constitute the nourishment of the kind of person you need to be to be the kind of person who lives in a certain place where the best people live in their minds and in their hearts and in their whole way of life and their whole approach to every morning and every night that they feel taken there as upon some delicate and beautiful ship connected to their own body and everything they depend upon, everything we depend upon, yet driven somehow by our own force of mind, our own force of creation, and meant to be, that the stars themselves declare the birth of the fire of the first tree, the first mother. Though our first mother was a tree. And all her trees remember. And all our mothers remember. And all these children remember. The wisdom and the nourishment of such a tree. This changes where you are in life, no matter where you are in life. And that is a story worth learning how to speak. Say hello to the sun. And the smell of possibly partly decaying salmon. And these, I think they're maybe chum. I don't know if it's like five to seven years cycles, or is it every year for some of them? I don't know. I think I read that somewhere. It's getting a bit lighter. <laughs> every shift in the hue of light, uh, the cold, the movement of air, it's, it's really quite a complete level of stimulation out here. I've had some marijuana, it, it bears noting. and. Uh, I've had some Amanita for, I think it's the fifth day now, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, had uh, on each second day, if you will, had profound emotional experiences related to my parents. Profound experiences, profound forgiveness, profound love, profound, most profound of my life, actually. I, I, I understate it, because it's, it's just such a... It's so nourishing. It wasn't meant to be overpowering. It was so nourishing. It was like the, the kindest therapist one could ever have in my own heart. Just the truth in my heart. The truth of the love and of, that I have for my parents. You know? And, uh, you know, and the next day, back to hating. <laughs> and I, I don't, I don't want to bear um, false witness of the Amanita Muscaria. I, I'm glad I've practiced just being starkly honest with people because I think it, one can very easily be misleading, you know, so it's not just about not trying to be misleading, or of course I'm not misleading, it's that we can all be misleading, especially dealing with important information, so, so I mean, I don't, I've never thought while I'm taking Amanita, and certainly more sober, if you will, of mine than I am now, at never point did I thought, oh yeah, I would just recommend this to other people, I just, it's a, it's a delicate area. I know for me, anyone that told me about eating a mushroom, like, first of all, you got to know, dude, that I, I just don't eat anything because somebody tells me. That's one. That's a big one, I think. 
You know, and so it's like, if you're going to talk about eating mushrooms, just like, say what it did for you, have a nice life, you know, and that's fine. And if someone were of, of a different kind of interest, then for that person, I would say, oh, yeah, uh, I'd never tried eating Amanita raw, and it's actually not bad. I'm glad I ran into someone, uh, a local mushroom expert, who said, yeah, yeah, just go and eat them. But he didn't seem to know that they had, like, medicinal effects, maybe of the kind that I'm, I would report, but... Uh, you know, that maybe it's a personal thing. So it was a process of discovery for me. Uh, I think he basically suggested they were neutral, like you had to dry them first, you know, to, but uh, uh, I'm having a very, if I may say, a, a nice acquaintance with the Amanita muscaria, a red-orange type, um, what I call the, the Christmas mushroom. And what other people, I think, call the Christmas, Christmas mushroom, too. And it's nice. It's nice to find something about Christmas that isn't, like, you know, wrapped up in literally biblical scales of perversion, you know, which is still very, very festive, you know. <laughs> you know I should put that, make that part of my comedy routine. Biblical sales of sodomy and perversion, but it's just very homey. It's very, very Christmassy. And when you talk like this, it's all very Christmassy. Ding dong, ding dong. Oh, do 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 do. Your cock gets bigger and yay. You roll your brother's anus over, stick it up, and say, "Hey, it's Christmas time to get real open with your bum." Yay, yay. Cause we're gonna run this sleigh right up your boom 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 boom. boom. <laughs> all right, that's my attempt at satire. I don't know where the sun is. I kind of got to loosen up. I've got a stiff back, you know, I've got a, yeah, i got a bit of a stiff back. My wing, my wing area, people, if you've got wings, you know what it feels like when they're stiff? Fuck. You can't get in there, you know? I want someone to just, like, just grab where my wings touch my body and just, like, just, like, fucking, like, screw them around. <laughs> Break them off if you need to. I'll just grow a new set, because it really hurts. Is this camera still running? Wow. Come on. Stoners of the world unite. Our minds have power over the weather. We can do it. This is how my warlock friend usually looks. And his mind, no word of a lie, is, is focused. This guy is like the most focused guy I ever met. And I have nowhere near this man's focus. I feel a little bad hanging out with him because I think, I think one should be focused. You know, focus is a good thing. You know, if, I suppose if you're combating evil, you should be focused. You know, but I find it's good for me to shift focus. <coughs> I try to like, if you've noticed in my videos, I'm trying to not to talk about psychopaths as much. It really gets me down. I think that's, you know, that's a losing game for me. That's a, that's a non-zero-sum game. I, uh, I, I've gotten a lot out of it. I'm going to 